Okay, how do we welcome the stranger in the context of leading and preaching in a church service? Let me focus on the preaching aspect first, and if there's time, I'll then speak a bit into how I think that relates to service leading as well. When it comes to preaching about welcoming the stranger, it's important to bear in mind that you have two audiences. You have those in the majority, so who regard themselves as members of your congregation, and those who don't, perhaps newly arrived migrants, those exploring faith, or returning to church after a long time. So how do you preach a sermon that's going to be relevant to both? Well, here are some ideas. To begin with, I think it's important to stress that the concept of welcoming the stranger is found right throughout the Bible. You may have a particular passage you need to focus on that day, and that's fine. But I believe it's crucial for your audience to understand that welcome and hospitality are overarching narratives in Scripture. You could point out that throughout the Old Testament, God repeatedly disrupts humanity's tendency to exclude others. For example, God disrupts a building project at the Tower of Babel, which is concerned with uniformity. And he does this by dispersing people into different languages. Later on, we see God's chosen people trying to build a racially and religiously exclusive community over and against others. And again, God counters this way of thinking by sending prophets to remind them that God extends his love to all nations. Then you have the judges. We have someone like Ruth, who is from Moab, so she's an outsider. And yet she is included in the genealogy that links to David and therefore our saviour Jesus too. So you have this important thread running throughout the entire Old Testament. But of course, the most significant moment is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whom there is no longer Jew or Gentile, where those dividing walls have come crashing down. So what you're trying to communicate is that the cross was not simply God's judgment on the sins of the world. It was also God's judgment on any form of institutionalized religion or way of doing worship that seeks to exclude the stranger. And I think providing this meta-narrative is crucial if people's hearts and minds are to be informed, inspired and shaped by scripture and the whole of scripture. Now, meta-narrative aside, a sermon must point people to Jesus, and so it can be helpful to remind your audience that Jesus himself was a stranger. He was a refugee, wasn't he? We know in his early years, his parents had to flee to Egypt. So as you encourage your listeners to look to Jesus, you can help both audiences, so those who are part of the majority and those who are not, to see that Jesus identifies with the stranger and welcomes a stranger at the same time. And that's why I find it so powerful when Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you did for me. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus encounters many outsiders and strangers. And as you preach, you can draw attention to that fact. It is often the stranger whom Jesus commends for their faith, like the Roman centurion or Canaanite woman. The image of a true disciple in Mark culminates in the healing of blind Bartimaeus, who again is an outsider. So that thread that I mentioned that runs throughout the Old Testament also runs throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. The lepers, the beggars, tax collectors, women at the well, and so on. So don't be afraid to preach of Jesus who reveals God's heart for the stranger. It's all there. I want to pause on the story of the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15 for a moment, because when she first asks Jesus to heal her daughter, he refuses her and he says the words, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now the word for right here, which is kalos, implies what is morally right. So morally, he ought not to help her because his first priority is on the house of Israel and she's an outsider. So he's stating the position at the time. But what I love about this passage is that having just stated the moral status quo, (laughs) Jesus then proceeds to break it by healing her daughter. You see, even the morals of the time to which the disciples clung on to did not prevent Jesus welcoming the stranger. And that's a challenge for those of us in the church who find it difficult to welcome certain groups of people. I like the phrase, you know, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And that's what we're sometimes called to do when we preach. Okay, I've talked about content, but what are some practical things we can do when welcoming the stranger? Well, if you're planning on using stories or sermon illustrations, I suggest ensuring you have some diversity in what you use. There's a famous uh, Christian course out there where people watch a video and then discuss the content over food. And for many years, the speakers and illustrations were very middle class and white. Stories about boarding school, cricket, law and so on. And in my church in Hong Kong, where we had many refugees, this created a normative culture that wasn't welcoming. So having illustrations and stories that people can identify with is important. It also reminds established members to look beyond the borders of their own comfort and traditions too. And in terms of service leading, I often use artwork from different parts of the world. One of my churches in Bristol is very liturgical. They like to follow the prayer book. And so sometimes I'll intersperse poems or collects from other regions in the world to punctuate our prayers and worship time together. 
And if you have a rota for Bible readers or people to say the prayers, again, use it as a platform to involve different people so that their faces can be seen and their voices heard during the corporate expression of worship. As I said earlier on, a sermon ought to point to Jesus, and so it's not too difficult to steer a sermon's conclusion in the direction of the Eucharist or communion. The whole imagery of inviting people around the banqueting table is incredibly powerful in making strangers feel welcome in your church. In the Gospel of Matthew, the miracle of feeding 5,000 in chapter 14 is immediately repeated by the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 15. Why does Matthew record this miracle twice? Well, the first crowd was predominantly made up of Jews, and Jesus was demonstrating that the heavenly banqueting table is for God's chosen people. However, the 4,000 people on the other side of the lake were not Jewish. They were predominantly Gentiles. And so when the disciples ask Jesus how he's going to feed this crowd, they're not asking if he can miraculously multiply loaves and fishes again because they've seen him do it. What they're asking is, are you seriously going to open the banqueting table to them too, to strangers? What does Jesus do? He says, I have compassion for these people and he feeds them. So when we preach God's word, we are to feed everybody. So if you're preaching in a church tradition where the Eucharist is central to worship, you can craft your sermon to carry these ideas of welcome and compassion into the Lord's Supper, which is a beautiful picture of word and sacrament and welcome coming together. So those are just a few ideas to consider when preaching about welcoming the stranger. Number one, make sure you preach at a macro level understanding of welcome and hospitality. Number two, make sure to illustrate how this is revealed and expressed through Jesus Christ. Number three, consider using inclusive stories, images, liturgy in and around the sermon. And number four, as Jesus opens the banqueting table to all, consider how you might link word and sacrament together in how you share communion, depending on your particular church tradition. And Louisa, I'll hand back to you.